I would like to switch the language we are sp speaking in English uh, tonight, uh, and we have a talk by Emmanuel Didier, uh, who uh, is there among us, uh, uh, despite the strike in France, <laughs> uh, which begins to, uh, tomorrow, and not today, uh, we have chance, this is the reason why he can um, he can be there, um, and um, we are particularly uh, glad to welcome you, uh, Emmanuel, here at um, our uh, university in Halle. Um, I would like to introduce you um, to you, Emmanuel Didier. Emmanuel Didier is a um, sociologist working um, at the CNRS. Um, this is the functional equivalent of the DFG in France. Uh, the CNRS is the National Research Ad Agency, actually. And he's working at the CNRS uh, as um, a research director, um, which is uh, um, a very uh, demanding, uh, uh, demanding uh, post at the, at the CNRS uh, itself. He's working in the field of quantification. quantification Quantification in sociology is, um, is a young field, but is a very important one. Um, he has um, um, made a research uh, stay and also a teaching stay at uh, several universities, uh, for example, at um, um, the University of UCLA um, in, the in the United States or at the University uh, of Chicago. He is also uh, teaching uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in France and also at Polytechnique, at the Ecole Polytechnique in France, um, and also at the Ecole Nationale de la Statistique et de l'Administration Économique. So is, uh, uh, everyone in France was also here uh, at Berlin uh, um, uh, in 2000, 2006, I think, you were there in Berlin. Um, and um, he is publishing a lot of uh, works um, on the topic of um, quantification in sociology. For example, the uh, book who is uh, coming out uh, next year um, at the MIT Press uh, about um, uh, America by numbers, quantification, democracy, and the birth of national statistics. Uh, and has also uh, published several works, for example, on benchmarking with uh, Isabel Bruno uh, and the French state under statistical pre pressure, uh, and also on uh, statactivism, hmm, uh, which is a kind of uh, reappropriation of, um, of uh, numbers and of statistics by uh, civil society in order to. Uh, um, in order to influence um, uh, the um, government decision, for example, and it was uh, here in France. He's also working at the moment on uh, big data in the field of, um, of health, um, and particularly um, related to um, the genetics and the constitution of databases uh, related to human genetics, for example. Um, so this is uh, a picture, a broad picture of uh, what Emmanuel Didier uh, is doing in this field. Um, and um, I would like to invite you to, to give your talk now. Um, and we have the possibility after the talk to ask questions to Emmanuel Didier. Thank you. Also, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Ich bin sehr froh, hier zu sein. But I will speak English. <laughs> Because it's too hard to speak in German for the whole uh, talk. So my talk is entitled Quantitative Marbling. Um, 19. 19 is the number of France Telecom employees who took their own lives at the workplace in 2007. The spate of suicides would raise questions of our corporate culture and would bring the telecoms group and its former CEO, Didier Lombard, to trial earlier this year on charge of moral harassment. Among the many figures put forward during the proceedings, total company debt, number of, of employees' resignation, and so on, 
One number above all others, the number 19, which, will expound, which we will expand upon later, played a critical role. The figure, initially compiled by trade unionists, would shock the nation and force French officials to publicly distance themselves, themselves from the group's corporate policy. In other words, the number would infiltrate myriad layers of French society to influence ordinary workers and decision makers alike. Ultimately, the figure itself played a key role in bringing a corporate policy into the public arena. This number, 19, perfectly illustrates the impact of quantification within social contexts. Not only the numbers travel within society, they shape it over time. Based on this premise, we contend that numbers infiltrate society to its very core to form a network of veins of varying shape, depth, depth and size, referring to here as marbling. This paper proposes to develop the concept of marbling and to expand upon both the underlying meanings and the consequences associated with it, its use to convey the powerful influence of numbers in society. <clears throat> to do this, we will not have to start from scratch. It is commonly acknowledged now that statistics and quantification methods in general can be instrument of both information and power. To put it differently, quantification processes do not emerge within society naturally, but materialize, materialize through social and political processes, and in this respect, they deserve to be approached as an object of sociology in and of itself, and not just as a means for producing knowledge. A growing body of compelling research confirms this premise from two distinct, distinct perspectives. One school of research has focused on analyzing the relationship between quantification and objectivity by examining in, de in detail the way quantification has shaped science and, consequently, our daily lives. The other has shown how statistics have radically altered the modes of governance and, more specifically, how quantification methods have been used to justify public policies. The two traditions of research, an American approach largely from the historical perspective and a French approach mainly from the sociological one, are nowadays accepted as standards. These two schools even appear to be structuring themselves into a subdiscipline in its own right, that of the socio-history of quantification, which adopts a transdisciplinary approach and is chiefly concerned with power relations and precise empirical inquiry. Yet, there are two particularly striking limitations to this body of research. First, it mainly addresses expert quantification practices, be they scientific or administrative. Other than a few rare counter examples, a bottom up perspective is rarely used when looking at the pyramid from the position of ordinary quantification processes. Yet, our daily lives are subject to an increasingly powerful and often problematic flow of quantities. Second, the social history of quantification has yet fully to evaluate the mass arrival of big data. Up to now, it has mainly focused on quantitative forms that pre-existed this, this flood of new data. It studied surveys, accounting, indicators, etc. There, are, of course, a body of, there is, of course, a body of literature on the subject of big data, but excluding a few exceptions, the literature in question, by and large, is by and large ignorant of the social history of quantification. So this paper aims to build on the tradition of this uh, history of social history of quantification to explore new pathways via the concept of marbling to allow us to recapture these objects, ordinary quantification and big data. It is not a question of op op opposing different approaches to quantification, but rather of considering these as a continuum allowing for the analysis of a wide range of interrelated practices. We will not focus on specific empirical fieldwork, but will suggest ways of furthering various areas of existing research to demonstrate the description and organizational benefits of the notion of marbling. In other words, our article offers both a program and an analysis. And an analysis. In this regard, we are laying the groundwork for a general sociological approach involving the exploration of social phenomena through the heuristic device of marbling. Thus, 
the social history of quantification is no longer limited to a mere subdiscipline of science and technology studies, but can be seen as a comprehensive method for the accurate study of almost any social object. So our talk will be structured as follows. First, for ordinary social quantification practices to be captured through marbling, we will start by proposing a new definition of quantification itself. And then we will see how this new definition enable, enables us to develop the concept of marbling as a tool for capturing quantities within social context by lo looking at three distinct examples. So now my first point, defining quantification. Social historians of quantification commonly define the activity of quantifying from the perspective of the expert. Through this top-down approach, it admit, is admittedly useful, sorry, through, though this top-down approach is admittedly useful, it nevertheless limits our insight into how numbers circulate between everyday and official contexts. It is therefore necessary to provide a broader definition than one customarily give, given. According to Desrosiers, quantification is the act of expressing in numbers that which is originally stated in words. This definition is rooted in mathematical theory in which a, matter, a measure is a function between any set of elements, not exactly any because it has to be a Boolean structure, and real number. Each element in the initial set is associated to a number, in other words, to its measure. De Rosier insisted that in real life, these transformations are part of a two-step process. First, the actors need to agree on what deserves to be quantified, which requires determining, de determining equivalences and categories. And next, second, they need to measure them, it has to, it has to transform the agreed upon entities into numbers. For example, it took several decades of conventional groundwork to define the category of unemployed, as differentiated from the independently wealthy, from the person who are sick, for, from the inactive population. And ultimately, after this, this made it possible to measure unemployment rates by conducting a very complex national population survey. Though the accuracy and relevancy of this definition is undeniable, it places the emphasis on expert practices. To establish initial conventions, like the notion of unemployment, and subsequent measurement tools, like the employment survey in France or in Germany, one must have significant cognitive, economic, and institutional resources. Since De Rosia was chiefly interested in the work of his colleague at INSEE, colleagues at INSEE, the National Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies, his top-down view of quantification is not surprising and offers, what is more, a fascinating account of the processes we are interested in. But it also make it, makes it difficult to demonstrate the key but often overlooked role of ordinary quantitative processes in the production of numbers in society, including when experts expert themselves use ordinary numbers. We must insist here on the fact that quantities are omnipresent in our daily lives, and not just in aspects related to official businesses. Of course, some figures do emerge from a substantial amount of investments in forms, to use an expression by, uh, invented by Tevnu, <clears throat> as with the official unemployment numbers we chat about over a coffee. Others, however, are ba basically st straightforward, for example, when I mention picking up a dozen eggs at the store or going on vacation a couple of weeks. Expressions like these may merely provide an approximate count. For example, a couple of weeks could mean either precisely 14 days or roughly 14 days, but they do, in fact, count. Social sciences have corroborated this di direct role of numbers in everyday social contexts. Historians, for one, never seem never to have encountered a society devoid of numbers. Furthermore, according to speciali specialists in ethnomathematics, a sub sub-branch of anthropology that emerged in the 70s, specializing in the study of mathematic pra mathematical practices, there are no known societies without accounting systems. The only difference in li lie in the complexity of the systems used. Some groups, such as the Ikwae Way people in Papua New Guinea, 
associate numerical concept with their body in direct relationship with their cosmogony in systems that allow them to represent very large numbers. Other societies with, traditional, with, uh, with oral traditions, such as the Munduruku, living along the Amazon basin in Brazil, have small number counting systems that include words for numbering only up to five. The Munduruku count one, two, three, four, five, and then many. Similarly, linguists are not aware of any language lacking names for either numbers or number categories. Though, again, this latter may greatly differ from one another. Alongside our system opposing the singular and the plural, languages <coughs> may include a dual form used to refer to two entities, as, the, as does Arabic, or a pokal used to refer to some or a few items, often between three and five, as does Mavea, spoken on Mavea Island in Vanuatu. Lastly, cognitive scientists specialized on the in the ontogenesis of numbers and numeracy, meaning the way mathematical concepts are acquired by, small, by young humans, argue that all humans have a well-developed sense of numbers even during the first year of their life. Therefore, numbers are entwined with our everyday practices. The languages we speak and even our consciousness, which obviously cannot be discarded. All healthy society have numbers in common. Imai, Dorothy Imai from UCLA, argues that numeracy, the ability to produce and manipulate numbers, emerges first on the social level and only afterwards do interactions between the general population and the state produce more expert numbers. This direct presence of numbers can be accounted for by our determining categories that allow us to identify subsets of individuals within some categories. Wherever there, are, there is a series of units, names and numbers are inextricably intertwined. These numbers constitute an immediate resource for everyday actors. They can use them to present arguments without needing to do the heavy groundwork of establishing expert equivalences and carrying our, out subsequent investigations. Often, the work is already done and the result readily available. We don't need to be expert to count different cases, to evaluate quantities, and to make numerical comparison of entities. These operations are similar to, and are readily available as, other non-quantitative language devices. We quantify individuals by saying two, just as naturally as we qualify them by saying children. In other words, nouns have no primacy over numbers. They, have both resources at the they are both resources at the same elementary level. Quantification, seen from this perspective, is not exactly a question of transforming nouns into numbers, but of choosing from the linguistic, practical, and cognitive resources of a given society, resources that are numerical rather than literal, but that coexist nonetheless. Quantification is first and foremost a matter of opportunity contingent on a set of possible resources, easily and equally accessible to all individuals in society. This definition of quantification is easy to use for any, uh, to use for any social history of quantification study. We see quantification occur, we see quantification occur whenever we see actors put forward num a number-based line of reasoning. Therefore, any time we read, see, or hear two, six, GDP, a credit card number, or any other number form, the numerical argument meets our definition. In keeping with this principle of pragmatic, with the principles of pragmatic linguistics, we view it as part of a set of practices that interest us as a whole. However, it is easy, easily identifiable symbols of the number figures that trigger our interest. This definition calls into question the difference between specialized and ordinary quantification processes. Clearly, professionals do not systematically start by, by transforming words into Number, numerical entities. On the contrary, in the very early stage of their operations, they also use ordinary numbers, which they gradually consolidate through aggregation, hybridization, operationalization. Take, for example, the insect statistical category homeless. It initially relies on the non-specialist contribution of community actors. Therefore, Ours, our definition, is simply a broader definition 
than the one previously put forward. It enables us to include more actors and more actions in the quantification process. It allows us to better capture the bigger marbling picture. It is therefore a reversal of the Cartesian worldview based on mathematical reasoning. In one sense, we are saying that the world is in fact comprised of numbers. However, numbers are not at its, or at its origin, nor are they obscured by nature. On the contrary, they are highly visible and easy to grasp. They surround us and rub shoulders with us, day, to day, day in, day out, at the trail they leave provide, sorry, and the trail they leave provides a mean for understanding the society we in which we live. What we are proposing, therefore, is a kind of sociological mathesis universalis stood upright at last. So, now that we have a, definition of, a new definition of quantification, we will now consider three examples and provide a definition of what marbling might be. So first example, marbling in the making. Numeric information employed by, in, by an individual might be taken up in society by someone else to set off on an autonom autonomous course, the length of which depends on the numbers of times the information gets passed on. This movement of entities is described by Latour as a trajectory. The word, in fact, designates the movement of a mobile through a give, given environment, but it also evokes an unbroken straight line or a parabola traced by the movements. Yet, the movement of numbers is generally unpredictable and prone to collisions since their trajectories are contingent on the play of local forces. By following these moving quantities, it is possible to discern marbling veins traced into the foundation of society, the bedrock itself being an aggregation of countless elements. What do we mean by this? One particularly enlightening answer is found in the essay Statactivism, that uh, we edited with Isabel Renault and Julien Previeux, that examines cases in which quantification processes are used by militant activists to challenge institutions per perceived as unjust, unjust. In most cases, the actors are not specialized, but are, on the contrary, individuals who make ordinary use of figures. Yvon Duroy explained how the enumeration of suicides at France Telecom, presented in, our, in the introduction, made its way through the layers of French society in a compelling example of marbling. During the year 2000s, following the partial privatization of the National Telecoms Company, a hardline policy based partly on benchmarking instruments, was implemented by top executives with the aim of increasing staff productivity and mobility. The malaise of these new managerial methods was so deep that two trade unions movements uh, created what they called the In-House Monitoring Center for Stress and Mandatory Transfers Group in 2007. The team teamed up with doctors, psychiatrists, and sociologists, including several statisticians. The first thing they did was to launch a method methodical online survey for employees on questions of stress at work. The results of the survey were devastating. Two-thirds of employees reported stress at the workplace. One in six said they were suffering from acute anxiety. Alarmed by accounts of suicide at the workplace, members of the group decided to count them. A list based on numbers reported by local union branch was compiled for 2009. The count came to 15 attempts of suicide and the notorious figure of 19 for actual suicide. The number 19 was a bombshell that ripped through society and was deployed by media outlets to prove that the tragedies, and I cite here Yvon Duroy, were the appalling result of the major overhaul that had begun with the gradual privatization of the historic national carrier. The number also prompted the reaction from an expert statistician, René Padieu, an INSEE inspector general. In, general. in an interview with the press, he was quoted in saying that, so I show you the number because otherwise it's too complicated. <coughs> he, he was quoted in saying that the suicide rate for the working age population in France, age 20 to 60, was 19.6 suicide per 
100,000 people in 2007. And then he concluded that 24 suicides over a 19-month period meant that France Telecom rate was 15 suicides per year since the company counted about 100,000 employees. In other words, workers at France Telecom were less likely to commit suicide than other people. His statement set off a heated debate with the trade unions for whom the suicide rate of the popu general population could not be compared with that of the company. In any case, the number created enough of a steer to be heard by France Telecom CEOs. In late 2009, the company replaced its ex executive team, organized meetings with the trade unions on managerial practices, and froze its policy of mandatory transfers. The government ultimately responded to Given that some France Telecom employees were still civil servants, the case was referred to the General Inspection of Social Affairs, which conducted an investigation into each of the suicides. The affair is a textbook example of numerical marbling. It, takes, it clearly shows how a simple number, in this case the number 19, can infiltrate various social strata, strata another ge geological myth, metaphor used in sociology, and transform society. The number 19 itself emerges from earlier counts compiled by various institutions. In, in here, in our case, it's the watch of, watchdog group. It is established by ordinary individuals, unskilled and quanti in quantification techniques. So this is the national and the local union leader. And then it passed on from one actor to the next, some expert, some not, to form a chain that be can be quite long at time, since in our case, in this case, it goes from the ordinary worker at France Telecom to high-level government officials. Every time the number is taken up, it alters the relation between the actors involved. Here, it allowed trade unions to establish a link to the press, the press to organize debates with the experts, and lastly, the unions to get to the employers to hear them. Thus, this myriad reuses borrow a series of modifications that are produced by quantification and are interconnected to one another. They form tracks that are comparable to marble veins thrust into rock over millennia through processes of oxidation. The meandering of which tells the fascinating story of soci societal, societal transformations in relation to the displacement of numbers. In our case, they tell of a profound shift in the major French company. In other words, to put it very simply, the number 19 marbled its way into the bedrock of society to change French, France entirely, since the privatization of France Telecom was the first experiment in privatization, privatizing a big company in France. Yet, these quantitative arguments are governed by specific rules, including calculation in the operational sense of the term, which plays, a, of course, a critical role. Special considerations must therefore be given to the question of calculation to understand the movement and modification associated with the quantification reasoning. When we talk about quantification, obviously, calculation plays a very important role specific to it. How then does calculation fit into our th theory of marbling? Florence Weber, showed that ordinary cal calculation processes take place within the framework of social stages, to use Goffman's uh, concept, that determines many of their characteristics. She gives the example of a housekeeper who works for her neighbor, who is also a friend. And Florence Weber points out that the housekeeper records the hours spent cleaning in a notebook to differentiate them from the time spent at her neighbor's as a friend. Without the notebook, the two contexts could be entangled, which would be harmful to boost the, both the business relationship and <coughs> to the friendship. So the notebook is uh, con uh, essential to the calculation itself. Considering the similar theory of Calon and Muniesa on calculation made by leading experts, for example, stock market quotes, one could argue more generally that calculation occurs only on social stages that determine the method of cal calculation used. Thus, the nature of marbling as carved by calculation is largely dependent on the social framing, social framing in which it occurs. Calculation is not only something out of reason, it's something that is 
organized by social frames. So let's finish with this case of numerical marbling in the making by insisting on one of its key properties, that it, is at, that it at once holds together and is held by the various unveiled elements that constitute the calcite block. The marbling concept holds together both operations specific to quantification, such as calculation and categorization, as well as other less overtly quantitative elements of the social aggregates to which they are attached. To fully grasp the social and political repercussions of the above described 19, we need to first examine how the count came about and to then count a picture of, and then to give a picture of Didier Lombard at Anne France Telecom. Our decision of description of marbling follows the movement of numbers by focusing at once on both purely quantitative debates and on the issues of, and political tensions that run through society. So this is the end of my first example. Now I will move on to my second ex example, which is about establishing a marbling method. The point is now we just followed one single numbers, and now we will think about what is a method of calculation. While, <coughs> let me drink a little. While it is possible to observe the process of marbling in the making, as we've discussed above, marbling can also be observed after the fact, a posteriori, by examining the veins most frequently followed by numbers. Such an approach allows us to identify what is commonly called a method, in other words, a series of procedures of me or mechanisms whose interactions are regulated with the aim of quantifying a given object over time. The method is the stabilization of marbling vein over time. The remarkable success of quantified self-movement is a good example of such stabilized marbling veins. Initiated in San Francisco in 2007, too, the movement involves show-and-tell style meeting where self-tracking self participants share personal data. Such processes of self-quantifying are nothing new. But what sets the current movement apart is that, for one thing, data can be collected automatically by using wearable sensors, such as watch, watch bands that measure biological signals and connected bicycles, etc. And for another, public meetings can be organized during which participants share self-tracking experiences. For example, self-trackers interested in sleep quality may use sleep tracking devices which allow them to share information on dedicated databases. The da data entered on a daily basis plots an individual marbling curve that can be shared during meetups. These shared self-tracking experience, which are generally concerned with health, have been criticized by some as having an undeniable element of self-gazing and voyeurism. But even so, quantified self-meetups have developed all over the world. <coughs> Routine produced by self-quantifiers can therefore be seen as a marbling process comprised of extremely stable social aggregates, which methodically express a set of figures that describe changes in measured objects over time. The marbling veins thus produced are doubly personal, in that they measure the sleep pattern, say, of a given participant, as well as their approach. In other words, the uniqueness of the marbling vein lies not only in the spikes and dips traced by individual statistical curves, but also in the choice of what is to be measured. In other words, what participants perceive to be the object most suited to quantification. And yet, the data produced are commensurate to that of other fellow self-quantifiers, since standardized self-tracking technologies such as wrist uh, wearable devices, sensors, and collective databases enable users to rate themselves against the group's overall average and then discuss the rating publicly. Each of these veins of marbling merge to form a mother load of interconnected connecting individual strands. In doing so, the primary marbling vein provides an instrument for great, greater individual awareness and sorry, uh, provides an instrument for greater individual awareness of and control over physiological cycles. 
This is an obvious moralizing element to quantification through self-analysis in, the in, the, uh, in that the data produced can be used to establish life norms. Given that the figures in question infiltrate and transform different layers of society, the geographical locations of quantified self-groups takes on a completely different meaning. It is representative of the societies that partake in creating these norms. We immediately notice that the group's distribution is anything but homogeneous, chapter's location being, by and large, concentrated in the large, major, global urban areas. This kind of marbling came about through the radical miniaturization of bureaucratic... So I want to show you this. <coughs> this kind of marbling came about through the radical miniaturization of the bureaucratic quantification techniques of the first half of the 20th century, whose huge rows of coders and punching machines, so we see it on the left, on, the, on, your, on my right, on your left, <coughs> gave way to today's sensors and computers that allow quanti to be produced in an equally stable and consistent manner, but at a completely reallocated organizational, organizational cost. It is important to note that while marbling can proceed from a method in the sense that it stabilizes operations, it is by no means a methodology, as the later world would be normative. On the contrary, marbling consists of the operations that actually produce numbers and that therefore shape social aggregates. Finally, stabilized marbling veins and those still in the making have singularity in common. A method is nothing more than a marbling vein in the making, which through repeated use will gradually consolidate the social aggregate that it is both holding together and being held by. Each marbling vein is unique. There is, there is no uniform impact of quantification. Marbling is therefore the, a concept that captures either a mechanism marbling in the making or a consolidated result of the mechanism, the marbling method, through which quantification acts upon society. It furthermore makes it possible to capture often overlooked social phenomena, those that emerge from the symbolic utilization of numbers. So now I will proceed to my third example. Symbolic marbling. As we saw in the introduction, the methods and repercussions of quantitative used as a, of quantification used as a tool for governing and providing evidence have been widely studied already. The problem is, though the interest of such, such association is undeniable, a substantial part of socio-historical quantification research focuses exclusively on those two areas of inquiry to the detriment of other quantities, which may constitute marbling veins in fields far removed from science and government, but with significant social implication all the same. Consider the example dealing with an aggregate that would appear to have nothing to do with quantification, but that is marbled with numbers nonetheless, the art world. Aesthetic theory, since Kant, has tended to view works of art as perfectly singular objects presenting infinite possibilities of imitation and interpretation. To quantify art under such terms, that is to say to categorize works into series of units sharing various identical characteristics, is either to deny or disrespect that which makes a work, an artist, a work artistic. But still, art has been quantified in the past. There is no need to give details on one kind of marbling veins those traced by the series of quantitative tools that financialized the world of fine arts at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, and by doing so, transform artworks, initially indicators of the collector's good taste, into fi financial assets. Much has been written on the subject. Let us focus instead on a second way of quantifying art that the artists themselves have contributed to namely by choosing the quantification of their own environment as the subject, the very subject of their work and a source of visual interpretation. Let's, let's first mention the work of Yame, who, uh, a contemporary uh, uh, accountant historian, who examined the surprising spread of account books in European paintings between 1300 and 1800. This period would see the development of accountancy and finance 
and will inspire a new category of professionals to want portraits representing their skills. Artists, then, would therefore begin to show an interest in these expert quantitative techniques as attributes of power. One compelling case is the census at Bethlehem by Peter Bruegel the Elder. So this painting is called the census at Bethlehem, painted in 1566, which interprets the theme of the census in a highly original manner. The painting is a classical representation of a biblical scene transformed into a scene from the everyday life in Brabant during the Renaissance. Mary is pregnant, wearing blue, and seated on a donkey. Uh, oh, sorry. No, sorry. Here is Mary. Can you see her? You don't see her? <laughs> yes? Uh, so she's sitting on a donkey. donkey. She is accompanied by Joseph next to her. Figured at the center of the painting, the two are nearing a building where the villagers have gathered to be counted in accordance with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. It is therefore a representation of the Arab arrival in Bethlehem, a classical theme in painting, although depicting a census is rare. So this theme is classic, but depicting the census itself is rare. Since the census agent is clearly collecting me, uh, money on this uh, image, the painting is often interpreted as a criticism, criticism of the heavy taxes imposed on the Protestant Netherlands by the Catholic Habsburg Emperor, Philip II of Spain. Philip II of Spain. But Megank, a half historian from Belgium, came up with an altogether different and perfectly convincing interpretation. By focusing on the global, on the gabled house in the center of the landscape, the gabled house that you see upstairs, toward the back, she suggests that the painting was commissioned by Jan Vleming, Jan Vleming, a wealthy mine owner who had just been granted domain, a domain and therefore knighthood. So she, she discovered that Jan, Vleming, uh, Jan Vleming owned this building. So she, she can prove that uh, the, the, the painting has been commissioned by this guy. The painting, she argues, is therefore the depiction of Vleming's loyalties to the Habsburg administration represented by the tax collectors. So I hope you see that tax were not only monetary but consisted of goods of in kind, pigs, barrels, and so on. Vleming was a staunch Catholic which close ties to the monarchy. Bruegel, therefore, placed the Virgin part of the religious conflict of 1566 in the center of the painting. Because unlike the Catholics, the Protestants were against Marian devotions. So painting the, uh, Mary in the center of uh, the, paint, uh, the painting uh, seems in fact to be Catholic. The painting, therefore, is not a criticism of the heavy taxes, <coughs> but, a rather, but is rather a narrative for worship, most likely painted at the requ request of a merchant bankers from Anvers. The subject represented in, is the professional activity of his client. Bru Bruegel is not criticizing him. Instead, he is addressing him as the new rural lord, financier of the king, and Catholic. The painting can therefore be seen as a reinterpretation, not just a simple portrait, but a representation of the power conferred on accountants and bankers by numbers during the Renaissance. A giant leap forward allows, allows us to take up the same question of how the power of financial quantification is represented in visual arts by following the marbling vein into the second half of the 20th century. Sophie Kras shows that a group of artists during the 60s and 70s explored the question visually, but but this time by focusing on the question of how numbers are transformed the field of art. Thus, Les Levin, in Profit System, once, Profit System 1, made works that consisted in his investing money in the stock market and then sharing the details of his investment portfolio and his earnings, which were actually substantial, with art magazines. The significance of his artistic gesture was threefold. Three Threefold. He was short circuiting the material production of the artwork, bypassing the actual art making process that he considered labor 
<coughs> he considered ironically laborious and illusory, and summing up art as a financial, financial flow. By doing this, he was stating, on the one hand, that artists should stage their own means of subsistence, and, on the other hand, that contrary to the stereotypical image of the selfless artist, they, like so many others, were driven by greed. His artistic gesture was therefore an atypical self-portrait of an investment banker. Krauss concludes by saying that Levin, together with other promoters of art, as promoters of art as an investment form, transform qualities into qualities, uh, quantities, the subject into the objective, and pressure into and pleasure into business. Thus, quantification, and especially the tangible instrument of its potential power, is a theme, is a theme that has been repeatedly explore, explored by artists in the early in the 30th century. This visual exploration of quantities, central to the work of many artists, would gradually inscribe marbling vein into the bedrock of the art world. The further study of which could be possibly could possibly lead to an unprecedented requantification of the field today. At the time, this example forces us to reconsider the potential of quantification. Neither Brugger, Bruegel nor Levin use quantification as either a demonstration in the scientific sense of the world, nor <coughs> as a direct exercise of power. Aesthetic consideration aside, it was the symbolic power of quantification that interested them. They weren't so much concerned with the empirical qualities of figures, which makes the enumeration of concrete objects possible, as with the capacity of figures to evoke abstractions and the unseen. This function, which can also be seen in Israel when streets are named with numbers, builds on a long Pythagorean tradition, the theology of which was based on numerical symbols. Thus, does numeric marbling give new symbolic potential to the role of numbers. All artists also work on the affect of, quantita on, of quantities, meaning that they stir up our emotion and sensation. They remain, remind us that quantification acts not only conceptually and politically, but also affectively. Looking at numeric marbling in fields that are a far cry from those usually prescribed by the history of statistics, science and politics, allows us not only to approach this discipline for a new angle, but also to refresh the socio-historical results on the social powers of quantification. Our illustration of how numbers are used in art is only one example among, among many of the potential for our approach. Recent literature, for example, has explored topics such as relations, relations between quantification and violence, or uh, quantification and emotional attachment to numbers. Having considered the three examples above of marbling, we can now offer a definition. Marbling is a sequence of unique and often unexpected social transformations caused by the movement of numbers within society. Numbers that can be singular, repeated in the form of a method, or symbolic in nature. All of these numerical veins are of varying length, meaning that each vein connects small or large number of individuals, the color of which of each vein differs too, seeing that they are produced by different kinds of numbers. They run through society like those in a block of marble and intersect and interact with each other to form a dense yet distinct path that allows us to describe internal tensions within society. So now my very short conclusion. In this paper, we have redefined quantification as the utilization of quantitative resources available to everyone, including in the ordinary individuals or within global data networks. This definition is more comprehensive than those that generally put forward until now. We went on to show how power relations between <coughs> things and agents determine the way quantity moves through society, tracing nonlinear, unpredictable trajectories that we suggest calling marbling. As these numbers marble society, they also redefine and reorganize it, forming veins found not only in scientific or governmental aggregates, 
whose literature has a tendency to confine them, but also in a wide range of social activities, for example in art, where marbling, marbling's enormous potential based on symbolic power deserves further study. Our world is now filled with numbers. We have to understand them as a major force of transformation in all social spheres. The tools here presented, a new definition of quantification and the model of the Marmi, might, might help us to do this. It opens up exciting perspective, I hope, to understand modes of transformation of most social aggregates. Thank you.